very good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to master class. This is a master class on GI pathology. Uh, in the first few master class, two weeks or two such master class, we had a first by Dr. Siddharth Dutta Gupta, and he talked about uh, liver and its liver biopsies in normal and abnormal conditions. Then we had a talk by Dr. Prasenjit Das, and he talked about uh, the biopsies of small intestine. Now coming to uh, the large intestinal biopsies, and we know uh, they are very important and two diseases, especially IBD and tuberculosis, and is so important for all of us. So for that uh, to discuss with us on the topic, uh, the interpretation of large intestinal biopsies, we have a none other than Dr. Anna Polimud. I think she is so well known in GI community uh, uh, all around the world. And, and uh, her work on, on, on GI pathology and also especially on uh, IBD pathology, including tuberculosis and Crohn's disease is remarkable. Dr. Anna Polimuth is a professor uh, of uh, pathology at a CMC Valor. She had been Dean and Principal of uh, CMC Valor, uh, a great academic person and a, and a great teacher. I think uh, all of us uh, uh, get inspired by her work and her her, her, uh, her, her uh, and we got inspired by her work. So we look forward to listen to Dr. Uh, from Dr. Anna Polimuth on large intestinal biopsies, its interpretation. Uh, to, and to moderate uh, the, the session, we have uh, two very eminent pe uh, persons. One is Dr. Amit Datta and the other one is Dr. Sridhar Sundaram. Amit Datta is a professor of gastroenterology at CMC Vellore, very well known, a great teacher and a very dear colleague. Uh, so is Dr. Caesar Sundaram. He is an assistant professor at Tata, Memorial, Tata Medical Center or Tata Memorial Hospital in, in Mumbai uh, and a very dear friend. So welcome Dr. Anna Pulimud, Dr. Amit and Dr. Caesar. And uh, uh, we go forward to the lecture. A couple of things that uh, uh, you can write your questions on the chat box and uh, all three of, the, of them, Dr. Anna, Dr. Amit and Caesar will uh, Take your questions and discuss your questions. Number two, that there will be poll questions. And once you respond to poll questions, uh, you might minimize your screen, uh, the poll question drop down a box so that you can see the whole slide. With that, I hand over uh, to Dr. Amit and Dr. Caesar Sundaram uh, for the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting us, us to be to moderate this session. And uh, as you say, Dr. Anna Polimur is well known all over. She's been my teacher and during undergraduate as well as gastroenterology training. So over to you, ma'am, to start the this lecture. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And uh, we'll start without any uh, waste of time. So uh, our topic for today is large intestinal biopsies. And I'll also be touching a little bit on uh, the differentiation of intestinal TB from Crohn's disease. Uh, so the gastrointestinal mucosa actually holds the key to the most important inflammatory and neoplastic disorders of the GI tract. And evaluating the mucosa gives us clues to the pathogenesis, diagnosis, severity, response to treatment, and complications. And uh, many hundred years ago, William Osler once said, a good clinician is first a good pathologist. So it's really important for clinicians to understand the pathology of the diseases that they are treating. So we look at normal mucosa, abnormal mucosa, including IBD, and then mucosal biopsies and the differentiation of TB from Crohn's disease. So the normal large intestinal mucosa is uh, made up of epithelium and lamina propria. So you see, um, uh, and connective tissue, in, uh, the lamina propria is the connective tissue between the epithelium, and you have a layer of smooth muscle at the bottom, which is the muscularis mucosa. There are subtle variations from the cecum to the rectum, primarily in the kind of inflammatory cells that are seen and in the thickness of the muscularis mucosa. The epithelium itself is arranged in straight, non-branching tubular crypts that extend from the muscularis mucosa at the bottom up to the lumen. Uh, and in the normal mucosa, the gap between crypts should be less than the width of a crypt itself. But this depends on having a well-oriented biopsy and a biopsy with intact muscularis mucosa. 
So in this particular biopsy, the muscularis mucosa is not present. So there's a little bit of splaying and it looks like an increased gap, but this is actually normal architecture. Similarly, if the crypts are not perfectly oriented in the biopsy, you may see them looking like this, oval or round or slightly different shapes because they are not cut straight. But again, this architecture is normal. And if there's any doubt, uh, an experienced pathologist will not have any problem in evaluating these kinds of of uh, changes. Uh, lymphoid follicles are another place where the mucosal architecture may be quite different. So here you have a large lymphoid follicle and the crypts in that lymphoid follicle appear to be missing. Uh, that is um, normal. And it's also normal for the crypts at the edge or any crypts present in the follicle to be branched. So when you're looking at branching, don't count uh, the changes in the lymphoid follicle or adjacent to it. Uh, at mucosal folds, and here, you know, this is the, the luminous surface, it's flat, but here there's a dip in the luminous surface and at that fold, uh, you can have branched crypts. And this is normal, it's not uh, considered abnormal. Uh, after looking at the um, architecture, you look at the surface epithelium. So in the surface epithelium, you have two kinds of cells. You have goblet cells, you see with this large vacuole like thing of mucin, and then you have these columnar cells that don't have any uh, obvious uh, mucin vacuum. So these are hyper uh, electron microscopic images of the surface epithelium. So you see this goblet cell full of mucin droplets, uh, another goblet cell. And here, this goblet cell has actually discharged some of the mucin onto the surface, mucus. And these are the columnar cells. They are between the goblet cells and they have a brush border like this. So if you look at the mucus on the surface of the uh, colonic uh, mucosa, on top of the columnar cells, actually you have a thin layer of mucin. Okay, this is called the glycocalyx. And uh, these are actually transmembrane mucins. It's a very thin layer and it forms a diffusion barrier to molecules and uh, water and uh, to uh, large molecules, bacteria also. But uh, generally the mucus on the surface has two layers. Uh, the layer on the inner side that is attached to the columnar and goblet cells is actually impermeable to bacteria. It's a very uh, tight barrier and uh, has a size dependent filter for bacteria. So it doesn't, the inner layer does not allow bacteria to come through. The outer layer of mucus, which you're not seeing in this image, can have commensal bacteria in it. Uh, mucus is made up of 98% water and uh, Patients with ulcerative colitis uh, actually have more permeable mucin uh, than normal individuals. So bacteria can approach the surface epithelium in ulcerative colitis, unlike in normal individuals. Uh, the other important thing about the surface epithelium is that there are tight junctions between epithelial cells. So whether it's a goblet cell and columnar cell or between goblet cell, uh, between columnar cells, this is a tight junction. So this is one cell, this is another cell. And the junction between them is so tight that water and ion particles cannot cross through this uh, barrier. So this barrier is altered in various situations. It's maintained by various proteins like uh, claudins or cludins. And uh, when this a uh, tight junction barrier is altered, then large molecules can come through the intercellular space and they can come into the lamina propria and uh, induce uh, allergic responses. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, the goblet cells are primarily secretory cells. So they secrete the mucus layer on the surface and the mucus layer they say is replaced every one to two hours which is very rapid. So the goblet cells are constantly replacing the surface mucus layer. But when there's a sudden discharge of the cytoplasmic mucus in a goblet cell, it takes about four to five hours for that mucus to be replenished. Um, yeah, so it's interesting to note that though they are sense, uh, uh, secretory cells, goblet cells also function as sensory cells. So um, uh, particles within the lumen can actually cross through the goblet cell cytoplasm and go into the lamina propria and activate dendritic cells here. So in the normal individual, this is actually for a tolerance and it maintains, it suppresses immune responses to uh, luminal antigens.
uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, the uh, sensory functions of goblet cells are multiplied many fold. So they respond to various bacterial antigens, they respond to dietary, uh, 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 dietary molecules in the lumen. Lumen. They respond to various drugs and antibiotics again in the lumen. They respond to uh, various inflammatory mediators and to uh, hormones secreted in the lamina propria. So the goblet cells actually can play a key role in uh, controlling some aspects of in inflammation. So excessive stimulation of goblet cells, the problem is that this can result in uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress, and this is one of the triggers for IBD. The crypt epithelium again has absorptive cells and columnar cells, but in addition to uh, goblet cells and absorptive cells, but in addition, they have some uh, more cells. At the base of the uh, crypt, you have the stem cells, and the these multiply and uh, the cells move upwards in the crypt. Uh, the cells moving upwards are called undifferentiated or transit amplifying cells. And these cells are influenced to differentiate into absorptive cells, goblet cells and endocrine cells. Uh, so this is a electron microscopic view of the crypt epithelium. And you see the um, goblet cell full of mucin droplets. You see the columnar cell here that doesn't have any large uh, mucin droplets. And then you have the endocrine cells. So normally there are very few endocrine cells and you can't make them out on uh, an H&E section. This is an immunohistochemical image of um, a stain using uh, um, uh, chrome, uh, chromogranin. And you see that there are just a few scattered endocrine cells in the crypt. A few going to the surface, but mostly in the crypt. And you see these are open uh, cells. That is, the endocrine cell extends from the basal lamina up to the lumen. So it can sense what is in the lumen and transmit signals into the lamina propria. Uh, this is an electron microscopic view of the endocrine cells. And you see the lumen here. So the endocrine cell communicates with the lumen, can pick up signals from there, and then discharge its granules into the lamina propria, where it can influence all the cells and connective tissue around it. So endocrine cells are um, uh, both secretory and sensory cells. They comprise only 1% of the epithelium and are dispersed throughout the gut. But collectively, they form the largest endocrine system in humans. And they respond to luminal nutrients, but they also respond to a range of uh, bacterial metabolites, hormones, and the neurotransmitter signals. And they influence gastrointestinal enzyme secretion, motility, appetite, and so on. Um, so in inflammatory conditions, you see this is the endocrine cell here, and it responds to the bacteria and microbiome and its products. And in response, it discharges its uh, granules. And these granules can actually contain uh, cytokines, or they can influence cytokine production by adjacent epithelial and panic cells. They can influence the fibroblasts to stimulate growth factors and uh, make stem cells multiply. They can also affect the tight junctions between cells and affect permeability. They can also increase the transport of secretory IgA. So you see these cells, endocrine cells have so many functions, um, you know, though we, we hardly can even see them in the mucosa. Uh, they secrete various hormones and uh, this is just a list of some of the hormones secreted by endocrine cells in the colon. Um, the stem cells are in the base of the crypt. There are three to five stem cells in each crypt base. You can't really see them on histology, but if you do special stains, you can identify them. They ensure that the epithelial turnover in the colon is every three to five days. And uh, they give rise to the transit amplifying cells, which are influenced by the connective tissue or stromal cells around the crypt to differentiate into the different cell types. In addition to the epithelial cells, you have lymphocytes in the epithelium, and the lymphocytes in the gut epithelium have specific homing receptors for the epithelium. And they're predominantly CD8 T cells uh, with a few CD4 regulatory cells. And normally, there are less than five T cells, five uh, ep uh, lymphocytes per 100 epithelial cells. Uh, they play a role in tolerance to luminal antigens and to commensal bacteria. Uh, they also prevent pathogens from coming through the epithelium. And if by chance there is damage to the epithelium by pathogens, the lymphocytes play a role in uh, restoring epithelial integrity. So it's interesting to note that uh, lymphocytes are highly motile uh, within the epithelium. They keep moving along the epithelium, along the basal membrane, between cells, and um, they kind of are uh, scanning the mucosa for things coming through. And they rapidly localize to epithelial cells that encounter pathogens. Uh, 
and they produce various antimicrobial factors and tissue repair factors. Other cells in the epithelium are used for macrophages and mast cells, but we don't have too much time to go into that. Uh, the lamina propria is made up primarily of a loose reticular connective tissue with capillaries and nerve fibers. And then there are the fibroblasts and myofibroblasts and all the inflammatory cells. So uh, the lamina propria is a major effector site of intestinal immune responses. So it's a very important place to study uh, the immune responses in various uh, uh, forms of injury. So lymphocytes, um, uh, the predominant lymphocytes are T cells. They're probably the most uh, dominant cell, if not for plasma cells. And uh, among the T cells, most of them are effector CD8 cells. Some of them are CD4 cells. And most are activated T cells. So they're ready to react to anything that uh, comes in to stimulate them. There are also natural killer T cells. B cells are actually smaller in number, normally about 7%. And uh, the important integrin on lamina propria lymphocytes is uh, alpha-4 beta-7. And uh, this binds MADCAM. This is a receptor on intestinal uh, vascular endothelial cells. So alpha-4 beta-7 binds to MADCAM and makes the lymphocyte come into the gut mucosa. It's interesting to know that um, the, the drug vedolizumab used in IBD actually blocks alpha-4 beta-7. So it blocks lymphocytes from entering the gut mucosa. Um, B cells are activated in the lamina propria when they come into contact with the appropriate antigens. They proliferate in the lymphoid follicles, either in the mucosa or in the lymph nodes. And once they're activated, uh, they differentiate into plasma cells. And they, the plasma cells initially produce IgM, but they quickly class switch to IgA. So uh, gut mucosal um, lymph uh, B cells switch to IgA production, and uh, most plasma cells in the gut mucosa produce IgA. And Th2 cytokines induce uh, uh, IgA production, whereas Th1 cytokines downregulate IgA production. Uh, macrophages are a very important cell type in the mucosa. Their normal function is just scavenging. They'll clean up anything that um, any necrotic material or debris in the mucosa, anything that comes through and from the lumen will immediately be engulfed by macrophages. And macrophages are activated to, uh, to, be, to participate in immune responses only in inflammatory conditions. Normally, they may do a little bit of suppressive activity, but activation comes only when there's uh, some trigger for in, uh, an immune response. So this is, um, we've stained the uh, mucosa for different macrophage antibodies. And you see the surface epithelium here, this is the basin membrane and then the connective tissue. Most of the macrophages are located just below the surface epithelium. They're waiting for things to come through from here. They're waiting for any necrotic debris from cells that are dying here and they'll engulf and clean them up. So the maximum expression of receptors of macrophages here is scavenger receptors. Um, eosinophils are um, uh, an important cell in the mucosa. It's interesting to note that most of the eosinophils produced in the bone marrow actually go to the human gut. And normally they provide, a, they play a role in providing immunity to the microbes in the lumen, uh, but they also play a role in controlling inflammation, tissue remodeling, and linking innate and adaptive immunity. So it's just, I'm just trying to show you that every cell type has so many functions in the mucosa and so much of interaction between uh, every single uh, cell type with all the other cells. Mast cells actually constitute about two to 5% of the cells in the lamina propria. Again, we normally don't see them. You can see them if you look hard, an average of about 13 cells per high power field in the normal colon. But the uh, mast cells are involved in both inflammatory and allergic processes. And uh, they secrete various inflammatory mediators and uh, have Ig re receptors for allergic um, uh, antigens. They also play a role in remodeling because the, the products of histamine and tryptase, they stimulate fibroblast growth. So mast cells play a role in fibrosis and tissue remodeling. Uh, they release um, mediators that affect motility, water secretion, visceral sensitivity, and the gut barrier function. Uh, dendritic cells are bone marrow derived antigen presenting cells, and they maintain a balance between the suppressor uh, responses in the normal mucosa and the um, effector responses in inflamed mucosa. Dendritic cells, once they're activated, uh, may either stay in the mucosa or migrate to the uh, iliac lymph nodes. And it's just interesting to note that colonic um, uh, drainage, uh, a lot of it is to the iliac lymph nodes rather than to the 
mesenteric lymph nodes. And dendritic cells induce uh, T cells to uh, migrate back towards the gut. Uh, coming to the stromal cells, this image, these images actually are immunohistochemical images for um, smooth muscle actin, uh, which are expressed in the myofibroblasts and fibroblasts. And you'll see there's a thin layer of these around the crypts. Um, this is actually the sheath around the crypts, which forms a basal membrane that stabilizes the epithelium, keeps it in place and is attached cells are attached to each other they're also attached to reticular fibers in the lamina propria even have connections to the muscularis mucosa so you can see that they help to form a network uh, throughout the mucosa uh, along with the contractile fibers and the uh, stromal fibers uh, the these fibroblasts produce the matrix they help epithelial cells to differentiate into the different cell types and they even play a role in immune regulation uh, this is an electron microscopic view. You see these are the epithelial cells. You see the intercellular junctions are quite loose in the basal part of cells. Between basal part of cells, there's a loose uh, intercellular junction. Uh, this is the basal membrane here, and you can see the fibroblast sheath. So this fibroblast will touch this fibroblast. And you can see that they've also secreted some fine reticular fibers around them. Uh, the only practical... Uh, point about pericryptal fibroblasts is normally you don't see them. They're just a thin sheath. If you use immunohistochemistry, they become very obvious. Or if you look under very high power, you might see some you know, thin uh, stromal cells. But sometimes the uh, section goes through the plane of the pericryptal fibroblast sheath. So this section around the, the sheath around the script has been cut through here. And you see how these pericryptal fibroblasts look like epithelial histiocytes. Many uh, new uh, pathologists or, uh, you know, people who are not very familiar may mistake this for a granuloma. So this can be uh, identified as a pericryptal sheath because when you go to consecutive sections, you'll see that it's actually the, the script will extend towards here. So this is really not a granuloma. Other stromal cells are the fibroblasts around blood vessels. They are called pericytes, and they synthesize the basal membrane there and support um, new vessel formation when required. They also respond to various antigens and uh, uh, hormones. The connective tissue itself consists of the basal membrane and the reticular fibers around uh, in the rest of the lamina propria. So the basal membrane is a thin layer of uh, connect, uh, connective tissue, mainly uh, collagen 4, and it's only about 50 to 100 nanometers thick. And you just see it as a thin line in the normal section. Uh, and it's uh, the connective tissue in between is a lot of reticular fibers, a little bit of elastin, and uh, some uh, ground substance like protein. Glycans. And just to note that all these fibers are constantly being deposited, degraded, remodeled. So even the lamina propria is not static. It's constantly being uh, renewed every few weeks to months. And uh, different stromal cells produce this connective tissue. So this is a, a reticular uh, uh, stain showing you the reticular fibers around the crypts and in the stroma, how there's a network. And these are all connected. So if this is connected to the muscularis mucosa, you can imagine anything, any contraction of the muscularis mucosa will be transmitted to this network. So capillaries, there's a superficial and deep capillary uh, plexus in the mucosa at here and at the top and at the bottom. And these are connected by vertical capillaries that go between them. Lymphatics are generally believed to be absent above the muscularis mucosa and the colon. There's some study that I saw recently where they've shown that in certain inflammatory conditions and in neoplasms, lymphatics might appear in the lower part of the mucosa. Our nerve fibers are located in the muscularis mucosa and deep lamina propria, afferent and efferent fibers. So they're sensitive uh, to various signals and also transmit signals. Uh, they're increased in numbers in IBS and they're altered in their expression and numbers in Hirschsprung's disease. The muscularis mucosa is made up of smooth muscle and elastic fibers, and it contains also nerve fibers and mast cells. It consists of an inner circular and outer longitudinal layer. It increases in thickness from cecum to anal canal, and it keeps the mucosa constantly in a state of movement, slight movement to agitate the luminal contents and expel the contents of uh, the crypts. So are there any questions about the normal mucosa? Uh, so no questions as of now, ma'am. Uh, I think we can uh, we can 
Um, ma'am, can I just maybe I'll ask you a couple of things since normally yeah. discussing. So, ma'am, when we like uh, send biopsies, you know, we get biopsies from us actually. So, you may sometimes say it's a superficial biopsy. So, what what means a superficial biopsy, and when is a biopsy that adequate, say, for a pathology description? Yeah. So, uh, superficial biopsy we is particularly. I mean, the depth of the biopsy is particularly important if you are evaluating for IBD. Because um, inflammatory changes in IBD classically happen in the deep part of the mucosa. If you see inflammation in the superficial part of the mucosa, you don't diagnose IBD. So unless you have the deep part of the mucosa in the biopsy, uh, it's not uh, you know, very useful. Also for certain, you know, when you're evaluating dysplasia, when you're evaluating serrated polyps, it's very important to have the deep part of the mucosa. But by and large, even if you don't sample the muscularis mucosa, uh, we are still able to manage. You don't have to sample the muscularis mucosa. If you sample that, it'll be good. The orientation will be good, but um, we actually don't worry too much about the muscularis mucosa being present. The other important point I forgot to mention is, and actually Dr. Prasenjit's class last week, uh, two weeks back, he had covered extensively the process of taking biopsies, how to orient them, and all that is very important. But I, I don't think there's any point in repeating them in this class. So if anybody has any doubts, please go back to Dr. Prasenjit's lecture. There's another question by uh, Ramiz, is it? Uh, yeah, uh, I think this is this is from from the last class, I guess. He wanted to know how to differentiate amount of lymphocyte between celiac disease and eosinophilic uh, gastritis. So uh, I think, uh, I mean... Uh, the number of lymphocytes, yeah. Uh, you want to know how to, uh, what the lymphocyte count should be? Is that what? Yeah, I mean, I mean, since he's asked the question, um, I think this was... Yeah. This was I mean, lymphocyte count uh, in the colon is much lower than in the small intestine. So in the small intestine, uh, in the West, they say 25. I think generally in India, most of us go with a count of at least 30. So if the number of lymphocytes is more than 30 per 100 epithelial cells, you say that it is abnormal. In, okay. uh, but you can get increased intraepithelial lymphocytes in so many conditions. So microscopic um, you know, enteritis or uh, lymphocytic enteritis, so many conditions are there. So you have to look right. at all the other features to distinguish celiac from other diseases, not just the lymphocyte count. Okay, okay. Thank I'm, uh, you. I'm in terms of say colon, when you say between the right and left colon, any glaring differences when you say look at histology? Like the thing is in, the, in the cecum and ascending, you might get more eosinophils than in the descend, I mean, in the left. Uh, the other thing is the thickness of the muscularis mucosa, but that's not really very significant in any pathology. So the important thing, I think, is just the inflammatory content. So, uh, Pam, I have one question now. Usually, as, as part of practice, you take mapping biopsies uh, from different parts. So, you take from, from ileum, you take from right, transverse, left colon, and maybe the rectum. So, I mean, uh, is there something specific that the pathologist actually looks at when you're looking at the mapping biopsies different from... I'll show you. I'll show you. I've got okay. illustrations okay. of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did somebody else want to ask a question? Ramiz Raja. Yeah. So we have taken it up, ma'am, already. That is okay, that's the question we asked. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay, so coming to the uh, evaluating an abnormal biopsy, again, it's in the same order. We look at the epithelium, the architecture, the lamina propria, the inflammatory cells. Then we look at what the fibroblasts are doing and the blood vessels are doing. So here we start with the first poll question. The first response of the mucosa to injury is increased proliferation of stem cells, neutrophil infiltration, epithelial restitution. And if you don't know what restitution it is, it's the movement of the epithelial cells to cover a gap and release of mucus from goblet cells. Which is the first response of the mucosa? Okay, so, so is this a we of um, the results? So a majority have actually said release of mucus from epithelial cells. And actually that is uh, the correct answer. Um, so if you look at the 
the immediate response of mucosa to injury is release of mucus from epithelial cells, mainly from the goblet cells. This is because the mucus is uh, the first barrier to uh, any um, luminal uh, pathogens or anything dangerous in the lumen. The next events will be all the other things, you know. So if there's significant damage to the epithelium, the neutrophils will come in. If uh, there's significant damage, then restitution or uh, if uh, epithelial cells are lost and the surface epithelium will come in, uh, flatten and cover the gap or uh, stem cells will multiply to replace any damaged cells. But the first response is release of mucus. So here you see the normal mucosa has um, crypts that are full of um, goblet cells with lots of mucin in it. And this is mucosa with an infection. And you see how um, the crypts contain hardly any goblet cells with mucin in it. This is because they have already discharged all their mucus and it takes time for mucus to be replaced but again, if the injury is continuing in the lumen, the mucin is continuously discharged into the lumen. The other thing that you're here is you're seeing regenerative change. So this dark appearance of the, mu of the um, epithelium is because cells are producing more RNA to multiply and to uh, synthesize more mucin and various protective factors. So uh, they have a lot more RNA in them and they look more bluish in color. Um, so another response to injury is flattening or shortening of the surface epithelium. This is because of damage. And uh, this is also how a restitution, if there was early loss of epithelial cells here, the epithelial cells from here will flatten out and spread out and cover the surface. Okay, so that is restitution. And that's seen early in injury. Um, so shortening of the surface epithelium. The other change on surface epithelium is if it's being tickled from the luminal surface, it'll throw tufts into the lumen. So this kind of tufting of the surface epithelium into the lumen is indicative of some luminal damage. Um, the other thing you may see on the luminal surface are different infectious agents. So this is cryptosporidia. And here you're seeing bacteria adhere into the surface of the epithelium. So remember, normally if the mucus barrier was good, this would never have happened. Uh, sometimes a crypt epithelium has viral inclusion. So in CMV, normally inclusions are in the stroma, but in this particular severe case of CMV infection, there are these intranuclear eosinophilic inclusions in the uh, epithelial cells. Uh, the other change you may see is apoptosis and uh, Actually, apoptosis, the process itself takes only, it uh, happens within minutes. And within minutes, it is also cleared. So normally, you don't see apoptosis in the crypts, even if it's taking place. Only if it's increased a lot, you will see it in a histological section. So there are different disorders associated with increased apoptosis, and you distinguish them by the other changes that you see in the mucosa. Uh, normally, you don't see any changes in endocrine cells and inflammation, but if you do uh, immunohistochemical stains for um, different uh, hormone content, hormones in the cytoplasm, you will see that there's a change in the hormonal content of the endocrine cells in various inflammatory disorders. Um, in the presence of constant inflammation and stress to the stem cells and the stroma around it, the stem cells that are multiplying will give rise, can give rise to cells that are normally not present in that tissue. So when you have a new cell type, not normally present in that tissue, appearing because of stress, usually because of stress, that is called epithelial metaplasia. And in the colon, uh, you can get panic cells, which are normally seen in the small intestine. In the right colon, you can see them. But once you see panic cells in the left colon, you know that that is panic cell metaplasia and it's a response to injury. So panic cells you can identify by these very orange colored granules located above the nucleus and they're usually at the base of the crypt. So here you see it under low power and this is under high power. Uh, the other kind of metaplasia that you see is um, uh, um, pyloric type metaplasia that is of the gastric type glands. The pyloric type glands can appear in the right colon when there's significant injury. So this is more common in Crohn's disease than UC. Panic cell metaplasia in the left colon is more common in UC than in Crohn's. So when injury goes beyond the epithelium, 
when it affects the basal membrane and the connective tissue around it, then the crypts can get remodeled. So remodeling can happen in individual crypts, like you see here. One particular crypt has been significantly damaged and it's got broken up. And when it uh, regenerates, the shape of the script will be quite altered. Uh, another time when there's significant architectural alteration is when there's extensive ulceration. And when the mucosa regrows, uh, it may not grow back with the correct architecture. Um, one of the changes uh, of architecture that happens is called disarray or change in the orientation. Remember, we said normally the crypts are uh, vertical. They go from the mucosa, uh, mucosal lumen to the crypt, uh, to the base where the muscularis mucosa is located, and they're straight and parallel. But here you're seeing these crypts are in different directions. This one is going straight. This one is going at this angle, as is this one. These are also angulated. This one is angulated in this direction. So this disarray is probably because of fibrosis around the crypt bases, pulling the crypts in different directions. Um, when there is a disruption to the basin membrane outline of crypts, then the epithelial cells can migrate outwards from the normal situation, normal location and form a second crypt there. And the second crypt may be in communication with the original crypt. So if this was the original crypt, there's one branch formed here, there's one branch, and there's another branch formed here. So the number of branches will be indicative of the amount of injury that you see. The more branching, the worse the injury. Atrophy is um, either the loss of crypts, and uh, unlike in the stomach where atrophy is loss of glands, in the colon, more than loss, you get shortening of the crypts. So normally the base of the crypt should extend up to the smooth muscle here, the muscularis mucosa. But here you see all the crypts are uniformly ending about a third of the uh, distance from the muscularis mucosa, third of this distance. So they've all become shortened. The only thing is when there's a lot of inflammation below the crypts, that can cause an art artifactual gap, though probably not in this case, but this artifactual gap uh, cannot be accurately uh, evaluated unless the inflammation has been treated. So ideally, atrophy should be evaluated in the quiescent mucosa. Uh, if the crypts, uh, crypts widen a lot, then the uh, mucosa between the crypts may have a pseudovillous kind of appearance. So um, this is called pseudovillous change, and it actually indicates very, very severe damage usually seen only in the left colon in UC. Um, so other than these architectural changes, you can get increase in various inflammatory cells. So lymphocytes can increase in various inflammatory conditions. And lymphocytic colitis is a disorder where there are 20 or more intraepithelial lymphocytes per 100 epithelial cells. So basically to count the intraepithelial lymphocytes, I will decide a point here in the epithelium which I will start counting. And first, I will count the total number of epithelial cells on the surface. When I reach 100, then I'll go back and again, and I'll have to note the place where I've reached 100. And I'll start again from here to here and count the total number of lymphocytes I'm seeing. So I will tell you how many lymphocytes there are per 100 epithelial cells. And anything more than 20 lymphocytes per 100 epithelial cells is abnormal. And um, it can be seen in all these disorders and a diagnosis of lymphocytic colitis is only made when um, all the other conditions have been excluded. Other intraepithelial cells are eosinophils, mast cells, and macrophages. Okay, acute inflammation uh, in the mucosa is um, very important to evaluate because normally uh, you don't get neutrophils in the mucosa. Even one neutrophil is abnormal, but uh, we may not call it active if there's one but there are even scoring systems where having two neutrophils in the lamina propria or in the epithelium will say that there is activity. So activity and uh, active inflammation, acute inflammation imply the same thing. But usually when uh, there's no chronic inflammation, we say this is acute if there are neutrophils. But if there's a background chronic inflammation, then we will say there are neutrophils in the background of chronic inflammation. So we will say the chronic inflammation is active. Um, so neutrophils first come into the lamina propria, the connective tissue, then they enter the crypt and the surface epithelium, then they en enter the lumen of the crypts, and then they can cause significant crypt damage with superficial erosions or ulcers. So here you see a crypt cut in cross section with neutrophils in the epithelium. 
Here you see again a crypt with a lot of neutrophils in the epithelium. Uh, when neutrophils enter the crypt lumen, it's called a cryptabscess. So when there are a lot of neutrophils, then it actually makes the crypt epithelium close off at the top. So then you see that it's like an abscess inside here because the neutrophils collect, they become necrotic, undergo apoptosis or necrosis. And then the, um, the mucin secreted by these epithelial cells will also collect and you get this crypt abscess and the epithelium around it becomes flattened because the, the stuff inside the crypt cannot drain into the lumen. So this is called a crypt abscess and it indicates more severe injury. Uh, of course, once there's a significant neutrophil infiltration, the crypt itself can break up. And if there's significant injury to many crypts, then you get an ulcer. So um, normally in a, in a mucosal biopsy, the biopsy process itself might take off the surface epithelium. Like here you're seeing, there is loss of the normal surface epithelium. So how do we know whether this is a real ulcer or not, if there's loss of surface epithelium? In this case, what you're seeing underneath that area is normal lamina propria. It's not different from anywhere else. So this is not a true ulcer or a erosion. This is just denudation of surface epithelium. But once there's a response in the underlying mucosa and something that often, often there's something that comes out into the lumen. Now this is an exaggerated response, but some neutrophils, fibrin will come out the cells, you'll see necrotic debris here, or if it's very severe ulceration, like in this case, the whole mucosa is replaced by granulation tissue here. So this, you know, is a, a real ulcer. So why is it important for us to be able to say that um, the clinician has sampled an ulcerated mucosa? This is because there are different kinds of pathology that are identified in areas of ulceration. So if the pathologist sees an area of ulceration, you can particularly look for certain kinds of pathology there, which are predisposed to ulcers. So that brings us to poll question two. So I've given you a list of disorders. Uh, in three out of four, there are significant histological findings in the ulcerated mucosa. But in one of these disorders, you don't see any significant change in the ulcerated mucosa. Which one is that? Which is that condition? Okay. So we've got almost equal answers for adeno and candida. So actually the answer is adenovirus because um, candida in the esophagus affects intact, can affect the intact epithelium. But in uh, the colon and small intestine, if you see candida, it's always in the ulcerated mucosa. It does not invade the intact mucosa normally. So if you want to look for candida, you actually have to biopsy the ulcerated mucosa. If you want to look for CMV, TB, you look at the ulcerated mucosa. But adenovirus is an infection of the epithelium and it will only be seen in areas of intact epithelium. So disorders associated with diagnostic finding in ulcerated mucosa are CMV, amoebiasis. Amoebiasis also, uh, it's more common to find trophozoites in the ulcerated area. Tuberculosis, you may see granulomas. Pseudomembranous colitis, you may see the membrane. Candida and mucor, you see the invasive hyphae. Malignancy is also often you see tumor in the ulcerated mucosa. Uh, coming to chronic inflammation, there are so many disorders associated with chronic inflammation and the lamina propria. And a very important aspect of evaluating chronic inflammation is knowing how much there is. Is it normal? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Or is it severe? So this is something that uh, you learn as you go along. You see more biopsies. You can evaluate and tell um, you know, more accurately whether uh, and consistently 
how much the inflammation is. And generally, we don't diagnose IBD, especially a new case of IBD, unless there is moderate or severe inflammation. With a mild chronic inflammation, we will not diagnose IBD. Uh, looking at the location of the inflammation also is very important. So in the superficial part of the mucosa, you can normally get inflammation either in a normal individual or in uh, mild infections. But when the inflammation goes to the deep part of the mucosa, below the bottom of the crypts, then it's usually a very significant inflammatory condition. And if inflammation is moderate or severe, then we diagnose IBD. In IBD, that inflammatory infiltrate may be a mixed infiltrate, lymphocytes, plasma cells, eosinophils. It may be predominantly plasma cells, which is called basal plasma cytosis. Sometimes you get a lot of lymphoid follicles in the deep part of the mucosa. And this is particularly common in, uh, in the rectum in uh, some cases of uh, ulcerative colitis. It used to be called um, uh, uh, lymphoid proctitis. Uh, also, we look at the distribution of inflammation within a segment. So suppose you've taken biopsies from the proximal, uh, from the, say, from the cecum and put multiple fragments. And you see that one fragment looks perfectly normal, but another fragment looks very inflamed. Uh, this is called patchy colitis. And this is also indicative more commonly of Crohn's disease than you see. It can also be seen in tuberculosis and so, some other uh, inflammatory conditions. So the distribution between uh, fragments is important. Uh, the other thing is within a fragment, distribution in the, in, uh, in the fragment. So here you see a focus of inflammation affecting just a few crypts and the surrounding lamina propria. When you look under hypa, you see those few crypts are infiltrated by neutrophils and the lamina propria has quite a lot of plasma cells, eosinophils and neutrophils. So this is focal inflammation, also more common in Crohn's disease. So uh, this was a question that Dr. Sridhar had asked. Uh, is it important to know where the inflammation is located? Okay, so these are actually segmental biopsies that have been taken from this. First one is from the ileum, second one from the cecum, transverse and rectosigmoid. So cecum ascending. So you see the ileum, you, can, you don't see any intact mucosa. This is very inflamed ileum. Okay, ileum is severely informed inflamed. The cecum is also very significantly involved. You're not, you're hardly seeing any normal crypts here. You're seeing everything else is ulcerated and inflamed. So very severe involvement. But here the transverse colon is not very inflamed, mild inflammation, and the rectosigmoid is perfectly normal. So suppose we had seen granulomas and the cecum in this patient. That would have helped us to know that the disease is predominantly in the ileum and the cecum, sparing the mid and trans, uh, descending uh, uh, left colon. So then our diagnosis is different from if we had seen granulomas either here or in this segment. Okay, so it's really important to know where the inflammation is, where the granulomas are located, where the ulceration is, and how the other segments look. Are they looking perfectly normal? or are they looking a little bit inflamed? And we'll go into those details a little later. Um, coming to specific types of inflammation, there may be some disorders where you get mainly lymphocytes, mainly eosinophils, macrophages, plasma cells, or granulomas. So increased lymphoid cells may normally be seen in lymphoid follicles. It's not abnormal, it's not pathology. Um, uh, many people mistake lymphoid follicles for chronic inflammation, but it is not. Even in a normal individual, you can get lymphoid follicles with germinal centers. But you get a lot of lymphoid cells in IBD. Sometimes it's difficult to differentiate IBD from a lymphoma. And then in that case, you have to look at the architecture, other segments, the scopy findings, and you look at, uh, of course, do immunohistochemical markers and molecular studies to distinguish IBD from uh, lymphoma. Diversion colitis also is associated with a lot of lymphoid follicles. Difficult uh, sometimes to distinguish from IBD uh, because of the number of lymphoid follicles, but the architectural alteration is less in diversion colitis. And of course, most importantly, we need the history of uh, diversion when you study this biopsy. So again, I haven't actually uh, emphasized the importance of clinicians giving uh, history to pathologists. Uh, I must say that uh, in our center, we have access to the clinical workstation, so we don't worry too much about clinical data, but uh, busy clinicians often will not uh, give much clinical history and then pathologists can mistake a biopsy like this for IBD when actually it is diversion colitis. Of course, lymphomas are the 
uh, um, hallmark disorder where you have increased lymphocytes and there are so many uh, features that help to distinguish uh, IBD and inflammatory conditions from lymphoma. Increased plasma cells, interestingly, are seen in IBD, in uh, various tumors, but uh, the hallmark disorder with increased plasma cells is IgG4 disease. So again, in UC, you can get a significant increase in IgG4 plasma cells, but you don't see the other inflammatory changes. And the number of plasma cells, IgG4 plasma cells, uh, is usually less than in IgG4 disease. Increase in eosinophils may be part of the mixed inflammatory trait of IBD or infections. But if you get predominantly eosinophils, then you think of allergic disorders. Like this is a predominantly eosinophils in the mucosa. It's allergic disorders, parasitic infections, or eosinophilic colitis. Um, macrophages, a few mucinophages are <clears throat> normal in the rectum. But when you have a lot of macrophages, in the mucosa, then you think of various disorders like whipples and um, uh, storage disorders and microbacterium, avium intracellular. Again, you use special stains to distinguish these different disorders. Small aggregates of macrophages are microgranulomas. Um, these are seen in Crohn's. Pigmented macrophages are also seen in different conditions. So it's important to identify them when they're present. Mast cells, normally difficult to see, but they're increased in various um, inflammatory disorders and uh, can be identified by uh, using a CD117 stain, which is the stain used for uh, G, uh, GIST tumors. Fibrosis is seen again in multiple disorders. Normally the mucosa doesn't have much fibrosis, but uh, sometimes some of these conditions are associated with fibrosis. So I think our next poll question is uh, to do, um, do with this. Can you identify this condition associated with diffuse fibrosis of the lamina propria? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so the answer to this actually is uh, SRU. We had equal answers for radiation induced colitis and SRU. Uh, both have um, increased uh, fibrosis in the lamina propria, but the amount of fibrosis you see in S actually much more than in uh, radiation-induced colitis. So uh, if you see here, SRU, the hallmark of SRU is when you get diffuse fibrosis, you also get a lot of smooth muscle upgrowth. And if you look under, you know, look carefully here, there are smooth muscle fibers coming in. You get uh, some amount of vascular telangiectasia, but not as much as with radiation colitis. And the other very important finding in SRU is that you hardly get any inflammatory cells in the mucosa. So there's a paucity of inflammatory cells in SRU. And that is actually fibrosis with a paucity of inflammatory cells uh, tells you that it's SRU rather than something else. But of course, the location in the anterior wall of the rectum and history of radiation colitis is also important. But usually SRU is not a diagnosis that you will mistake for anything else when you've seen a few uh, good cases. Uh, ulceration with fibrosis, again, uh, most common condition is ischemic colitis, but you can also see it with uh, all the other disorders associated with increased fibrosis. And in ischemic colitis also, you can get quite a lot of fibrosis in the lamina propria. Uh, there is actually a paucity of inflammatory cells here, but there's no smooth muscle upgrowth. And also the, the evenness of the fibrosis is not like in SRU. SRU is very dense fibrosis. Whereas here, it's a kind of more mild fibrosis. Another hallmark of ischemic colitis is if you do an iron stain, you'll see these macrophages containing iron in the uh, cytoplasm. So that's a feature of ischemic colitis. 
patchy fibrosis. This is a case of radiation-induced colitis. There's fibrosis here. And here you see, can you see these uh, dilated vessels? This is vascular telangiectasia. And that is, again, one of the hallmarks here, also vascular telangiectasia in radiation-induced colitis. Again, here you see very dilated capillaries uh, full of uh, RBCs in radiation-induced change. Um, the other change in radiation is these atypical fibroblasts. So getting that also tells you, here also you see an atypical fibroblast that tells you that it is radiation-induced colitis. Okay, so we come to the next poll question. Subepithelial fibrosis is seen in collagenous colitis, hyperplastic polyps, microscopic colitis, all of the above. Okay, so I think we've got, um, most of them have got the right answer of um, all of the above, but it's just a slightly tricky question because um, I don't know how many of you know that microscopic colitis has actually two disorders in it. One is collagenous colitis and one is um, lymphocytic colitis. So if you look at uh, in, uh, collagenous colitis definitely has subepithelial fibrosis. Uh, since collagenous colitis is one of the disorders of microscopic colitis, that also has um, subepithelial fibrosis. But interestingly, hyperplastic polyps also have subepithelial fibrosis. So the answer to this is poll quest is um, answer four, and uh, it's a slightly difficult question because most people will not know that hyperplastic polyps have subepithelial fibrosis. Okay, coming. So this is a, uh, an image of colonic mucosa. This is a surface epithelium and you're seeing this pink material below the surface epithelium. Looks very much like fibrosis, but actually in this condition, it was not fibrosis, it was not collagen, but it was amyloid. Um, so in collagenous colitis, this is the normal subepithelial basal membrane. You see how uh, thin it is, the layer of basal membrane. Uh, stained with trichrome stain. Trichrome stains collagen blue. So you're seeing this thin layer of blue basin membrane normally. But this is a patient with collagenous colitis. And you see the surface epithelium is actually uh, just very flattened. And here you're seeing this thin, this thick layer of a basin membrane. And it has some capillaries embedded in it. And the thickness of this is more than the thickness of a RBC. An RBC is about seven microns. If it's more than 10 microns, only we make a diagnosis of collagenous uh, colitis. So this is, a this is a patient with collagenous colitis diagnosed on a uh, special stain trichrome. But in this image that I showed you, the surface epithelium below that, there's pink material. And if you look very closely, this pink material actually is in the walls of capillaries. And uh, it has a slightly hyaline appearance. In this case, the special stains were not useful. But when we looked under the electron microscope, we saw the randomly arranged amyloid fibrils. Uh, submucosal fibrosis can be seen in patients with diabetes, hypertension, various inflammatory disorders. But it can also be seen in amyloidosis. So the diagnosis of this is with special stains. And here, this particular special stain, thioflavin T. It's an immunofluorescent stain. It shows you, highlights the amyloid in the vessel walls. Okay, vascular changes in various inflammatory conditions, uh, congestion, uh, hemorrhage, and uh, edema, all these things happen in the lamina propria, and they tell you uh, about the presence of activity and acute inflammation. This is severe ischemic, acute ischemic colitis, with a lot of hemorrhage and crypt destruction. Okay, so now we come to IBD. Uh, I think we won't take any questions now. We'll go on to IBD. And then if you have any questions for IBD, we will take that. So uh, for IBD, endoscopy and mucosal biopsies are central to the diagnosis. So you know, you know, most important is colonoscopy. Then upper GI scopies are used increasingly. And if you don't get any uh, lesion, then you can go in for double balloon endoscopy. So the gold standard is taking at least two specimens from at least five sites. But in our center, we take two specimens from four sites sites 
that is the terminal ileum, cecum ascending, transverse descending, and rectosigmoid. And uh, the diagnosis of IBD is based on chronic inflammation, architectural alteration, plus minus granulomas. So without these features, without significant chronic inflammation, significant architectural alteration, we do not usually diagnose IBD. The classification of IBD is based on where these changes are found. So ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and when you can't make out the two IBD unclassified, are diagnosed based on the distribution of chronic inflammation, architectural alteration, and the granulomas. So the, you, for a diagnosis, you need moderate or severe inflammation. Or you need inflammation in the deep part of the mucosa, as I said, and you need significant architectural alteration. One or two branched crypts does not constitute abnormality. You have to have more than two branch crypts and a disarray and all the other changes, atrophy, to make a diagnosis of IBD. Granulomas and Crohn's disease are usually small, and we'll look at this later. In UC, you don't get granulomas unless there's a crypt rupture and you get a pericryptal granuloma. So the granul only granuloma you can get in UC is a pericryptal granuloma. And based on this, you don't change the diagnosis of UC to Crohn's disease. So the classification is based on the distribution of all these changes. And IBDU is when you get chronic inflammation and architectural alteration, which are restricted to the colon, but you can't make out whether it is UC or Crohn's disease. And we'll go into a little bit more detail of that. So in UC, the inflammation has to be continuous. It has to be superficial and distally predominant. In Crohn's disease, inflammation has to be segmental, patchy, focal, or deep involvement of the mucosa, the submucosa. And of course, you can't evaluate lower layers in the mucosa. And if you have granulomas, that helps you to distinguish between Crohn's and UC. So the segmental distribution of inflammation architectural alteration, you see in a classical case of UC, the ileum is not really involved. The cecum has some inflammation. The transverse colon has significantly more inflammation as does the descending and maximum amount of inflammation and cryptabsis, this is a large cryptabsis, is seen in the rectum. So this is a classical feature of UC. Also, you note that all the fragments are equally involved. So in this fragment, all are equally involved. In this fragment, all are equally. Here, all equally. Here, all equally. This is diffuse inflammation, distally predominant. This is ulcerative colitis classic. Patchy inflammation is seen in Crohn's disease. One fragment involved, another fragment uninvolved. Focal inflammation, again, a feature of Crohn's disease rather than UC. Immunohistochemistry has been used in uh, recent um, times, but I won't go into the details. They've used uh, autoantibodies uh, to UC uh, uh, antigens and uh, try to distinguish between UC and Crohn's disease by the differential expression of uh, these particular antigens. Uh, looking at activity, it's based on how much of neutrophils there are. There are more than, I think, uh, 50 scoring systems for activity. This is one of the recent ones. Uh, this is only for UC uh, in grade zero, no neutrophils, grade one, uh, only chronic inflammation, no neutrophils, grade two, there's a mild infiltrate of neutrophils, grade three, many neutrophils, and grade four, there's an erosion or an ulcer. This is the NANSI grading system. In the uh, DCA system, there's a more recent grading system used for both UC and Crohn's disease. Advantage of this DCA system is it can be used for both, and it's based on the distribution of chronic changes, the architectural and architecture chronic inflammation and distribution of activities. Also based on how much of architectural alteration and chronic inflammation there is and how much of activity. So there's a different score for each segment. There'll be one DCA score for the ileum, one for the um, proximal colon, one for the mid, and one for the uh, distal. And if all are the same, then there's you indicate that the score is the same for all. Uh, this is just the details of the DCA system. So we come to the poll question five. Histological activity scores are twice as sensitivity, uh, sensitive as uh, endoscopic activity scores, or as sensitive endoscopic activity scores correlate well with the um, 
uh, uh, I can't actually see that. Yeah, I suppose you can see all the answers. Okay, so we had some interesting answers, and I think the second and um, third had a uh, maximum number of answers. But actually, the, the point, the actual answer is number two. So actually, histological activity scores are twice as sensitive as endoscopic activity scores. And actually they don't correlate very well with clinical disease activity scores. And they do correlate a little bit with relapse. So histological activity scores are different uses, but the most important thing is that they're more sensitive to the endoscopic activity scores and they are used in various prognostication in uh, IBD. So if you look at uh, histological activity scores, they're more reproducible when they're more simple. They're twice as sensitive as endoscopic they correlate uh, better when there's disease activity and uh, there's a poor correlation with clinical disease activity. But in UC, they're useful in predicting uh, flares, the need for corticosteroid use, hospitalization, and in Crohn's disease, they are useful uh, histological healing or when there's no activity, it's associated with decreased risk of relapse, uh, medication, escalation, and corticosteroid use. Um, histological activity is su superior to endoscopic scores in predict predicting the development of dysplasia and carcinoma. And uh, healing as a treatment uh, goal, uh, histological healing as a treatment goal is associated with increased clinical outcome, prolonged remission, fewer hospitalizations and decreased surgery. So um, mucosal biopsies are um, uh, the changes in uh, the mucosa uh, can disappear within a few weeks once you start uh, treatment. But if it doesn't respond, then biopsies are useful to identify refractory disease. The problem is that after the treatment of UC, if you take a biopsy, it may uh, the changes may begin to resemble Crohn's disease. IBDU is when you can't make a diagnosis on colonic mucosal biopsies. Uh, uh, to differentiate UC and Crohn's, though you can say that it is IBD. It should not uh, be used synonymously with indeterminate colitis, which is a diagnosis made on resection specimens. So when you use um, uh, the, the word U, it should only be used for uh, mucosal biopsies. And 5 to 15% of all new cases of IBD cannot be classified as IBD, as uh, UC or Crohn's disease. It's more common in children than in adults. Uh, we won't go into this. These are different morphological features of uh, IBDU. And it has a worse prognosis than UC and higher frequency of relapse, increased risk of colon cancer, and less favorable outcomes. Okay, then um, uh, we'll, I think we'll skip this part. This is where you uh, large intestinal mucosal biopsies are useful in distinguishing IBD from acute colitis. So this again is based on the intensity of inflammation, epithelial changes, depth of inflammation, and so on. Amebiasis, again, it's, it's the same thing. It's the amount of inflammation, architectural alteration, uh, activity, eosinophilia, that help you distinguish whether it's amebiasis or IBD. Uh, you can look for specific infectious agents like CMB or helminths or uh, various parasites to diagnose. Uh, granulomas are uh, important to evaluate um, for even other inflammatory disorders. So histoplasmosis is associated with granulomas. Yersinia is associated with granulomas. And here there may be necrosis also. Um, uh, Non-infective disorders with granulomas are chronic granulomatous disease. You can get multiple granulomas or confluent granulomas in um, the sarcoidosis. Very difficult to distinguish from Crohn's disease, so uh, or even from tuberculosis. So very important to have the history and uh, keep following up patients and uh, do all possible investigations to 
differentiate these different diseases. So coming to, I think we'll again skip this poll question. Uh, Dinesh, we'll skip this because of lack of time. Uh, we'll just go on to the next one. The answer to this, I'll tell you straight away. Yeah, MMF colitis. Okay, so the right answer is all of the above. So MMF colitis can present like GVHD, it can present like ischemic, it can present like IBD, uh, and it's often di difficult to distinguish from these disorders. It's important to have the history. The pathologist must know the history to be able to distinguish these diseases. So this is a case of uh, MMF colitis with a large cryptapsis. Um, NSAIDs also can cause a mild uh, ischemic colitis. Uh, a picture that looks like ischemic or an acute colitis. You can have uh, apoptosis in the crypts in ischemic, in uh, NSAID associated. This is diversion colitis we went through, again can resemble IBD. Common variable immunodeficiency is, can be associated with an IBD-like picture, but the architectural alteration and chronic inflammation are usually less than in the classical IBD. So um, diagnosis is based on architectural alteration alteration, chronic inflammation, but differentiation is based on the distribution of these, the intensity of these, and other useful findings. Okay, so we come to the last section. Do we have any pressing questions uh, from that section? I'm not saying, I think the questions they had asked, most of it actually were covered in the second part. Only one okay. question was that in children, allergic disorders, allergic sort of thing, and is, is it going to be difficult to distinguish IBD from the allergic disorder? Because eosinophils are high in that condition and it can be high in IBD as well. So what's your... Uh, yeah, but in uh, allergic disorders, you don't get much architectural alteration. And the amount of chronic inflammation other than eosinophils is not like in an IBD. I told you the chronic inflammation has to be moderate to severe to diagnose IBD, but you don't get that in eosinophilic colitis. So it's not very difficult to distinguish. One moment, that what proportion of CMV do you see inclusion body? That's another question. That in what proportion of CMV colitis do you see inclusion bodies on histopathology? Yeah, so actually, I think in the majority of cases, if the mucosa is involved, you will see the uh, CMV inclusions. Sometimes the immunohistochemistry is more sensitive. So then you, uh, you know, you uh, can do immunohistochemistry even if the uh, inclusions are not seen. But generally, you do see inclusions, but you have to look very hard. Sometimes you'll see only one inclusion if you look at 12 sections. You know, so you have to look very hard for CMV inclusions. They may be difficult to pick up. Sure, we can, because I think others are about infective collect, which you have covered well, so we can go ahead. Okay. So even this poll questions, I don't know, shall we cut the poll questions? There um, are two poll questions. And we have a about uh, about the 20 minutes yeah. left, so I'm, I think it, um, I think I've gone too far forward. I'll just quickly go back. Okay. So uh, differentiation of TB from Crohn's disease. Uh, poll question is presence of caseation, acephas, bacilli are the only useful features in distinguishing TB from Crohn's disease. Yes or no? Okay, so two thirds of you have said that um, only caseation and acid fast bacilli. No, one third of you have said only those two are useful in distinguishing the two disorders. Uh, and two thirds have said other features are also useful. And uh, the answer to that is yes, 
Uh, we believe that other features are also useful and I hope that uh, over the next few minutes, I'll be able to convince you about that. Uh, and the last poll question is this, knowing the location of granulomas, Knowing the location of granulomas and mucosal biopsies is useful in distinguishing TB from Crohn's. Poll question eight. Okay, so the answer is, yes, it is useful to know the location of granulomas and mucosal biopsies. Um, uh, again, I'll show you that in the next few slides. So the differentiation of, yeah, the answers, uh, most of you said, yes, it is useful. Okay, so the differentiation of TB from Crohn's disease is based on a combination of clinical features, radiology, lab, endoscopy, mucosal biopsies, response to treatment. So you cannot depend only on mucosal biopsies to get a diagnosis. Um, this is because actually the diagnostic yield on mucosal biopsies, even under optimal conditions, um, the highest yield will be 70% for Crohn's disease and 80% for tuberculosis. And this is if you have taken at least five fragments from the disease segments. So the gold standard, of course, is caseation acid fast bacilli, but the sensitivity of these is low. So in resection specimens, you may see AFP in about one third, but in mucosal biopsies, there are studies which say that only 5% of mucosal biopsies will have acid fast bacilli. And again, you can have various artifacts and uh, problems in evaluating acid fast bacilli. This is how they normally look. They're beaded and they're located in granulomatous areas. But there have been cases where I've seen tuberculosis being diagnosed on artifactually stained structures mistaken for acid fast bacilli. Immunohistochemistry also and PCR have limited use for uh, the diagnosis of TB when you look for MTB or uh, PCR because even patients with Crohn's disease can have MTB in the intestinal wall. So here we see we did uh, a staining of tissue sections with in situ PCR. So we did, uh, we put on the, uh, the, um, uh, the markers onto the tissue itself and did the PCR on the tissue. And uh, we found that we got positive staining for MTB DNA we put the primers on and we got MTB DNA even in a Crohn's disease granuloma. This is uh, for different reasons. You can have a tuberculous granuloma, a tuberculous bacteria in a Crohn's disease granuloma. So uh, caseation again is acellular necrosis and has to be distinguished from other types of necrosis and is not again as common as you would require to make a diagnosis of TB. So maybe about up to one third of uh, uh, bowel resections will have um, caseation in the bowel wall. Uh, lymph nodes have caseation more often, but again, this depends on whether the lymph nodes are available for sampling. In peritoneal lesions, the chance of getting caseation is very low. Mucosal biopsies, less than one third will show caseation. So again, we can't depend on caseation acid fast bacilli to make a diagnosis of TB or Crohn's. So um, there were some resection studies which had said that large granulomas are more common in TB, confluent granulomas more common in TB. But when we first encountered this problem, we didn't know what large was, how large is large. And uh, we do know that Crohn's disease can have confluent granulomas. So is it really useful? And the other worrying thing is that not all cases of granulomas. So will we be able to distinguish cases of Crohn's disease that don't have granulomas from uh, uh, cases of tuberculosis? So in surgical resections, generally granulomas may be seen in um, up to 90% of uh, uh, TB cases. Mucosal biopsies up to 80%. Um, I think we'll skip the slide. But uh, so we, we did a, a very detailed study. We did two different studies, one on uh, biopsies where we mostly did not have segmental sampling. And our second study uh, used segmental uh, samples. And we looked at different granuloma characteristics and various changes of inflammation to try and see whether there are different features that are useful in distinguishing TB from Crohn's. And so the different characteristics we studied were the size of granulomas, their confluence, the number in each section, lymphoid cuff, their location in the submucosa, their presence in the granulation tissue lining ulcers, and the segmental distribution. 
Other inflammatory changes we looked at were ulceration, chronic inflammation, architectural alteration, and segmental distribution of changes. When we looked at the size, we classified, we measured each granuloma using a, a graticule in our eyepiece, but actually generally the height of the mucosa is about 400 microns. So if the granuloma is larger than the height of the mucosa, it's a large granuloma. So here you see this is the mucosa and this is part of a submucosal granuloma you're seeing here. It's much larger than the size of the mucosa. This is a granuloma that was a little less than 400 microns. It's a medium sized granuloma. And this is a tiny granuloma, less than 200 microns in size, less than half the thickness of the mucosa. Uh, so we saw <coughs> large granulomas only in our TB cases. Um, you know, so 50% of our TB cases had large granulomas, none of the case of Crohn's. Confluence in 40% of TB, very few Crohn's disease. More than four granulomas in almost 50% of TB cases, but none of the cases of Crohn's. A lymphoid cuff was far more common in TB, 73%, but only 20% of Crohn's cases. Granulomas were located in the ulcer lining in almost 50% of TB cases, but only 6% of Crohn's. And the palisaded epithelial histocytes, so like the edge of a granuloma in the ulcer base, was seen in 60%, two-thirds of the Crohn's, uh, TB cases, but none of the Crohn's disease cases. Uh, location of granulomas in the submucosa, interestingly, was far more common in tuberculosis than in Crohn's disease. 50% of TB cases had granulomas in the submucosa. Whereas in Crohn's disease, um, only small granulomas were seen in 40% of the cases, not even medium size, only small. But only 15% of TB cases had very small granulomas. Only one single granuloma in the entire biopsy was seen in one-fourth of the cases of Crohn's, but very few of the TB cases. Poorly organized granulomas, where you can barely make out the edge of the granuloma or where it's very loosely arranged. This was more common in Crohn's disease than TB. It can be seen in TB, but it's more common in Crohn's disease. Small aggregates of histiocytes, not epithelioid, just histiocytes, were seen in 10% of Crohn's disease, none of the cases of TB. Pericryptal granulomas, that is a crypt ruptured with a granuloma associated with that, was seen in 13% of the cases of Crohn's, but none of the cases of TB. 3% of the cases of TB, that is one case. When we looked at where granulomas were located, so this was, we have uh, plotted every single granuloma that we saw in this particular series. And here you see in TB, most of the granulomas are located in the ileum, uh, cecum, and ascending colon. Whereas in Crohn's disease, there are more granulomas in the rectosigmoid than in any of the other sites. So you see a distal predominance of granulomas in Crohn's disease, unlike in tuberculosis. Panet cells, we did not see panet cell metaplasia in the uh, left colon in TB, but we saw it in 16% of our Crohn's cases. And focal colitis was seen in 50% of our cases of Crohn's, but only 20% of tuberculosis. Other inflammatory, so this is again, we plotted in each case, we plotted all the different changes. The red triangle is the granuloma. So you see in tuberculosis, um, wherever the granuloma is located, you have other changes. And in the adjacent segment, so here from the ascending and cecum. Here again, granulomas are in these segments, and that is where all the other inflammatory changes. The rest of the bowel is spared. Uh, here, all these conditions are like that. Where the granulomas are located, you see uh, architectural alteration, chronic inflammation, ulceration, and activity. But in Crohn's disease, you see the red triangles. Often changes are seen far away from the red triangles. So this case had no red triangles, but all these other changes. Here, the red triangle was in the rectum, but you see changes in the cecum, uh, in this flexure, in the transverse colon and descending colon. Similarly here, the um, granuloma was in the rectosigmoid, but there were changes in the ileum. So this diffuse distribution of chronic inflammatory changes away from the sites of granulomas was a feature of Crohn's disease. Here, this was the image that I showed you earlier, where the rectum is completely spared, transverse colon hardly involved, but ileum and cecum, cecum very markedly involved in a case of tuberculosis. Crohn's disease here, you see the ileum is mildly involved, 
The cecum is somewhat more involved. Cecum ascending transverse is paired. This is a skip segment. And again, the rectosigmoid is involved. So you see there's a skip lesion and uh, in inflammation in uh, both proximal and distal colon. Again, this is not like tuberculosis. So histological features that were not useful in distinguishing TB from Crohn's in our study were aphthous ulcers, architectural alteration, um, chronic inflammation. Actually, skip lesions and patchy inflammation, we saw both in TB and Crohn's. So they were sort of more common in Crohn's in one of the studies. But um, multinuclear giant cells also can be seen in Crohn's and TB. And um, if you take a perfectly normal, um, endoscopically normal area and biopsy it, both in TB and Crohn's, you may see one or two granulomas. So that doesn't help to distinguish. And the more number of biopsies from the distal colon that you take, the greater the chance of getting a diagnosis. Upper GI biopsies are useful. It's the same kind of histological changes that you see in the lower GI. In the esophagus, it's usually the mid esophagus that's involved. Gastric involvement is low because of uh, gastric acid. Uh, Duodenal involvement, again, is very rare, but the histological features in the upper GI tract are similar to those in the lower GI tract. It's just that in Crohn's disease and the esophagus, you may get lymphocytic esophagitis. Only lymphocytes are increased. Uh, gastritis and nitis are more common in children uh, due to Crohn's disease than in adults. Uh, in the stomach, you see granulomas more in the antrum than in the body. And focally enhanced gastritis is a, a classical feature of Crohn's disease in gastric biopsies of Crohn's disease. This is an image of focally enhanced gastritis. There are some conditions where tuberculosis can mimic Crohn's disease. And one of these is when treat, uh, TB has been treated. When you treat TB, the granuloma numbers come down. The, even the prevalence of granulomas comes down. The size of granulomas comes down. The background inflammation comes down. So it can easily resemble and be mistaken for Crohn's. It's really important to get the history of um, you know, significant treatment for tuberculosis when you talk to a pathologist. You can also get increased eosinophils in treated TB. So it's important again to know the history of treatment. There are many conditions where Crohn's can mimic TB, but I'll just highlight one, and that is an anorectal Crohn's disease. Here you can get multiple granulomas, you can get confluent granulomas, you can get granulomas in ulcer lining. So on a di on an anorectal biopsy, uh, it's a much more tricky thing to distinguish TB from Crohn's disease. You'll have to use things like caseation, acid fast, bacilli, PCR, and all the other tests. You rely on those more than in other sites. And uh, again, you can get PCR positivity for MTB in Crohn's disease. And this could be either because of latent TB that's present there, coexisting TB or incidental TB in that biopsy or uh, something called cell wall deficient bacteria, uh, which don't cause disease, but are present in the histiocytes of granulomas. So to summarize, you can distinguish TB from Crohn's based on caseation, acid fast bacilli, but also the size of granulomas, confluence, the number of granulomas, a lymphoid cuff, the location of granulomas, and all the other inflammatory changes like planet cell metaplasia, focally enhanced colitis, and the distribution of inflammation in different parts of the uh, uh, colon. So in, uh, unfortunately, in up to 20% of cases, you can't distinguish TB from Crohn's disease. So you may say uh, granulomatous inflammation not possible to distinguish TB from Crohn's. So in those cases, it's important to either repeat the biopsy or um, uh, give a trial treatment and uh, uh, repeat the biopsy after a trial. Uh, so uh, to summarize, uh, you have to sample the tissue adequately because uh, we need at least five fragments to make sure that you get a granuloma in a case of TB. And uh, you must segmentally sample all the other segments as well, even if they're not involved, do take biopsies from all the other segments and submit them in separate bottles because evaluating the location of granulomas and location of all the other changes helps to distinguish TB from Crohn's. And if you're not able to get a diagnosis, repeat endoscopy and biopsies, especially if symptoms persist or worsen with treatment. So this is one of my favorite pictures when I give a GI lecture. 
Uh, does anybody know who these are? Yeah, I'm sure many of you will know. The Nobel Prize duo. It's a pathologist and a G GI registrar. Okay, so they worked together and um, made a very, very significant uh, you know, discovery that changed the management of uh, gastritis and gastric and duodenal ulcers. So they wiped out the surgeons and uh, brought in the gastroenterologists and pathologists uh, to diagnose and treat uh, H. pylori infection. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for a really uh, enlightening uh, talk, I should say. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I think uh, Professor Jayanti has asked, in patients with acute infective colitis versus an acute severe ulcerative colitis presenting for the first time, how will you actually uh, differentiate on histology? Um, early in IBD, up to two weeks from the onset, the significant architectural alteration and chronic inflammation can be seen. So if it's before, two, I mean, if it's in the first two weeks of IBD, then you may have a little bit of a problem, but usually most patients will present with a history of more than two weeks. So after two weeks, significant architectural alteration and chronic inflammation will set in. And that's how you distinguish IBD from acute colitis. So the activity may be similar, Though even, even that people say the cryptabscess in ulcerative colitis is more in the deep part of the crypt than in the superficial. Uh, that's one point. But the activity may be similar. But architectural alteration and chronic inflammation are the hallmark to differentiate uh, IBD from acute colitis. Uh, so I, I think... Uh... There's Dr. Sushil who asked many times patients uh, presenting to us have already been started on ATT. So any way to differentiate histologically TB versus Crohn's when patient has received partial treatment? So usually they'll come to you, you know, long before they have had a long history of treatment for TB because uh, they'll come to you within a few weeks, maybe one month or one or two months. In that much time, the alteration is not too bad. It's after two months of ATT that actually the granulomas really start to disappear. So if they come within the first two months, or also many of these patients don't take the treatment continuously. So they'll take uh, treatment and they'll break it. So if they come after two months, then they should give you the history of significant improvement with, treat with treatment. If they've had two months of ATT and they've not had significant clinical improvement, then they probably don't have TB unless it's drug resistant. I think Amit sir. Uh, yeah, so somebody, ma'am, one more. Uh, somebody asked that should we take biopsy from normal appearing ileal mucosa? And we do it, but they want to ask you. So, what's the uh, importance of doing it from a ileal mucosa in Crohn's patient versus TB? Yeah, so it's important to biopsy the uh, ileum because uh, you know you see the gradation of changes from ileum to colon uh, in UC. So in UC, ileal changes will usually not be moderate. The changes will usually be mild. But in Crohn's disease, ileal changes are, if the ileum is involved, definitely it will be moderate or severe. But uh, by looking at the intensity of involvement of the ileum, sometimes in Crohn's you get granulomas in the ileum. So again, it helps you to distinguish the two. And one more thing is like, uh, if you look at the endoscopic appearances in Crohn's and TB, there are some uh, differences. Like you see a longitudinal ulcer in Crohn's patient transverse in TB. Is there any histological correlation study saying that when we see that on endoscopy, it often comes as a TB on pathology, like when you see transverse ulcer or patellus IC valve, any correlation from those findings to pathology findings? I think there's significant correlation. I don't know that there's been any study, but I would say that I, I remember a few cases where it was longitudinal ulcers, but TB, because we always look at these scopy findings. Yeah, so I remember the case where clinicians said it was longitudinal ulcers and they strongly suspected Crohn's, but it turned out to be TB. So it's a very rare finding, but just we should never go by one finding alone or one modality alone. Don't use only histology. Don't use only scopy findings. Don't use only radiology. Don't use your PCR alone. 
Well, that's a very know. very important point. Sure. Yes. Ma'am, one more thing. Like, yeah, sure. I'm continuing. Yeah, that's it. Ma'am, the other thing. One more question. Somebody has asked. No, like nowadays, artificial intelligence touching all areas of medicine or beyond uh, medicine. So, any artificial role of any artificial intelligence in you know pathological identification of normal, abnormal, and the things which you told us about different types of cells and all that. Yeah, I think it can definitely come. The problem is that there's so much of cells in one biopsy that uh, to scan that whole biopsy and make out the different kinds of cells uh, will take a lot of space. So actually, I did a study on um, uh, distinguishing epithelioid histiocytes from normal histiocytes, uh, you know, using image analysis. So we found that the nucleus and the cytoplasm are different. So you can use image analysis to distinguish an uh, epithelioid histiocyte from a normal macrophage in the mucosa. But the problem is the amount of time that it takes. A pathologist will do that in 30 seconds, less than 30 seconds. But a machine will take at least five minutes, 10 minutes, once you've really trained it. So I think for this, for at this level, it's not useful. But I think maybe when machines become much faster, uh, maybe it will be useful, maybe to count you know, we've started some studies where we're counting the cells that may help. So counting machines will definitely do much faster than human beings. But right now we are only using a subjective evaluation of moderate, severe, mild. We don't use actual counts. Thank you. Um, so one more, like, uh, you know, as you said, this TB Crohn's thing, experience is quite important for the pathologist. Like you get a lot of slides from different centers when they have problem with TB Crohn's actually. So just to ask you, ma'am, like for pathologists say, say TB Crohn's, is there a learning curve something ma'am in that regard to sort of say differentiate? I think if they, if they just follow those criteria, I think anybody anywhere in the world can do it. We get a lot of feedback from different okay. parts of the world that they find those criteria are useful. So you just find, read the criteria and then you use that. You know, it's not too difficult to apply it. Like you have to know approximately a large granuloma is more than the height of the mucosa. Small granuloma is less than half the height of the mucosa. That's all. Once you know that, then you can yourself make out. And you can count. And you can see which segment it is. So between the gastroenterologist giving the right samples and the pathologist just uh, doing a medical survey, you, in the majority of cases, you can make out. You can make a mistake, of course, but majority. And one final question. Like we saw this one other problem which we sometimes struggle in practice is we do colonoscopy. You find these ileal erosions and small this thing in ileum actually. I mean, the patient may not have a symptom of IBD. It's incidentally picked up finding. And then biopsy says moderate inflammation. So just to ask you, ma'am, that when uh, can a moderate inflammation also be, say, a, a non-specific finding or we have to investigate yeah. the full small bowel in such patients? Ma Definitely it can be due to NSAIDs mm -hmm. or something. But what I have found most useful is usually we'll, in, we'll ask the clinician, wait for some time and biopsy again after a year. So often the, in, the lesion will evolve or heal. So after a year, when you biopsy again, you will get a better answer. So That's repeating scopy and biopsy after some time actually often will help. That, that's what we do. I think that's, that's what we do in our practice as well. That's, that's good. One more audience question has come. Any insights into IBD unclassified pathological progression? So in terms of uh, like when somebody is unclassified today, in, in future, will it turn out to be? Pros? Mostly they turn out to be UC. Most cases of unclassified, I think, go on to be UC. But um, you have to wait. And repeat scopy and biopsies after some time. It will evolve. The pathology will evolve. So, Sridhar, any question, anything else? Any other audience thing you want to take up? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I think uh, we have we've already uh, crossed our time. So, sure. I think you can... So propose so a vote of thanks, sir. So, so thank you. With that, we come to the end of today's session. Thank you, ma'am, so much for that excellent, wonderful presentation. The slides were so easy to understand, a lot of pictures. I think all of us have learned a lot from that. So thank you again for giving this lecture to all of us. I also thank Dr. Sridhar for moderating this session along with me. I thank Dr. Govind for inviting Dr. Sridhar and myself for moderating this session. Thank Nisha, our, our, our staff in the ICG Secretariat in Delhi. Mr. Dinesh and all the technical teams would like to thank them as well. So, so, so this program runs in support of all these people.
and then before i close i just want to talk uh, mention about the next session the next session will be happening on uh, 26th of june this uh, 26th of june this will be taken by dr pooja sakuja who is a director of pathologist at uh, gb pant hospital delhi and she will be speaking on uh, mucosal biopsies in esophagus and stomach both normal and abnormal so all of you uh, please join on 26th because these sessions again i said very helpful for our residents as well as clinicians and so so please join us on 26th of june so with that we come to the end of today's session thank you thank you